Take your Bibles and open with me this morning to the book of Jeremiah. This morning we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and this will be an introduction to Jeremiah, the book, and to Jeremiah, the prophet. Uh, I'm mapping it out and thinking that we'll move through Jeremiah a little more quickly than we did through Isaiah because the material comes in larger chunks from Jeremiah as we go through the text. I I do suspect, though, this is probably going to take around a year and a half to get through Jeremiah. Like I said, the goal then is to do Romans, and I just don't know how long Romans is going to take. No idea. I haven't even started mapping that out. And then we'll do Ezekiel after that. Uh, I did say it would be a while, probably 2028, maybe, by the time we get there, 2029, but, uh, but we'll see. But as we are here looking at here, one of the major prophets and not major as in the minor prophets were lesser prophets. The minor prophets just wrote shorter books, had shorter prophecies to to the nation of Israel, to the nation of Judah. Not any less significant, of course. And if you haven't spent any time in the minor prophets, they are my favorite subsection of scripture. I've preached through all 12 of the minor prophets and the relevance to the world and where we are today is really quite astonishing. But here as we look at the book of Jeremiah, I did not realize this when I started. Jeremiah is, by words, the longest book in the Bible, 21,673 words. And in it, we hear preaching, poetry, and prophecy, all from Jeremiah, who has been named the weeping prophet. As I began studying about Jeremiah, getting ready for the introduction to Jeremiah, I was really struck by the humanity of Jeremiah. You you think when we went through Isaiah, Isaiah just kept just hammering the sovereignty of God and the glory of God. And we looked at Isaiah and you thought Isaiah was not somebody you'd want to mess with. He was going to preach you down. He was going to stare you down. He knew what he was saying. He had seen the Lord high and lifted up. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Now, part of that is because he's going to embark this morning in our text on a 40-year ministry preaching to the people and to the nations. And by all outward accounts, would be counted a failure. He did not have a successful ministry. Multiple times through the course of the book, we will see that he doubted and wished he had not been called to the point that he wished he had not been born. If I hadn't been born, I wouldn't have to do this. At one point in the book, he says, I don't want to preach anymore. I'll promise you, there's not a preacher on the planet that can't sympathize with the prophet Jeremiah. There sometimes you just don't want to preach. But what Jeremiah concluded was, I can't not preach. Your word is burning in my heart and it has to be proclaimed. Jeremiah, in fact, as we read, he's almost as moody as David in the Psalms. Have you ever noticed? I, I, if, if David lived today, they would have him on medication. Not the Holy Spirit, not on the scriptures, but on medication because he had high highs and he had low lows. What he found out was however high he went to the heavens, God was there. And if he had sank even to the depths of hell, he says, God was there. He knew that God was with him. Well, as Jeremiah preached, he preached amidst a people who were steeped in idolatry. We'll look at some of that this morning under the rule of Manasseh. They were full of ingratitude toward God. They were all about external practice of religion with no internal obedience to the law of God. The the point is, during his ministry, which began under the reign of Josiah, you'll remember, things were in such disrepair after Manasseh that they, they, they had to go rebuild the temple. And in rebuilding things, found the scroll of the law of the covenant. And Josiah had it read to him. When we see the message that he preached, it's a constant message. For the people to return to Yahweh, to come back to their God. Interestingly, as a sign to the people, Jeremiah, as we'll see as we move through the text, was not allowed by the Lord to be married. He was not allowed to participate in festivals and was forbidden to go to funerals, even for loved ones. And the significance there was his life was to be symbolic of the life of those who are cut off from all joy and happiness as judgment comes upon them for their sin. He was basically telling him, you are worshiping your idols and you're involved in this paganism and you think this is going to bring joy and happiness to you. But at the the end, you're going to find out that you're cut off from it all. It will destroy every relationship and every circumstance in your life. 
And his life was a living parable of that truth. He did have a secretary. The term used is his amanuensis, just as Paul had Timothy and Titus and others who would take his dictation and write for him. Baruch, the son of Neria, and we'll be introduced to him. His name literally means blessed. Yahweh is my light. He took Jeremiah's dictation and sermons. He wrote them down, recorded the prophecies. And at times he would even stand and read what Jeremiah had prophesied to the people, standing in for him to preach the word to the people. And again, Jeremiah would not have been considered successful. He would not have been considered to have had a fruitful ministry by today's standards of success. But I loved it that one commentator said, God, to God, he was an outstanding success because Jeremiah was faithful and he was obedient. He continued to preach no matter the threat, no matter the cost, and it did cost him. And as Judah was taken into exile, as he had predicted, he ended up having to deal with the fact that when they first went into exile, prophets popped up that said, oh, it'll just be two years, literally. Don't worry, this is a quick thing. It'll just be, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve and we'll be fine. That's what people were preaching. It'll be, you know, it's, this is, it's a vacation. It's an extended vacation. And Jeremiah said, no, it's going to be 70 years because of the nature of your sins against God. And in fact, what we'll learn, Daniel taken in the wave of the captivity, actually then later from reading what had been written and preached by Jeremiah, came to see that it would be 70 years and proclaimed that to the people in captivity that that time was coming close. Daniel didn't live to see it. He was taken as a 14 or 15 year old boy. By the time that 70 years was up, he had died probably just before they began returning to rebuild Jerusalem. But what we see is that Jeremiah was moody. He was fearful. He doubted his call. He didn't depend upon his own ability, but he couldn't stop preaching the word of God, because the words he was given to preach were the words of God. Let's read Jeremiah 1 verses 1 through 10 and then take a look at where he came from, the culture that he was involved with, and his call as a prophet. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of Yahweh came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. And it came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of Yahweh came to me saying, before I formed you in the innermost parts, I knew you. Before you came out from the womb, I set you apart. I have given you as a prophet to the nations. Then I said, alas, Lord Yahweh, behold, I do not know how to speak because I'm a youth. But Yahweh said to me, do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares Yahweh. Then Yahweh sent forth his hand and touched my mouth, and Yahweh said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to cause to perish and to pull down, to build and to plant. As we're introduced to Jeremiah and his family line, he comes from a line of priests from a city three miles northeast of Jerusalem, Anathoth. His father's name was Hilkiah. Now, it just so happens that the person who found the scroll that he took to Josiah to read in the cleansing of the temple, rebuilding of the temple, was also named Hilkiah. Not the same person, but they are both named Hilkiah. But Hilkiah here is actually believed to be in the priestly line of Abiathar who was a priest under David and under Solomon and who descended himself from Eli, who kept the ark when it was in Shiloh there for David in the time of the prophet Samuel. The timeline for us here is BC 627 to 570. So this is 500, almost 600, a little over 600 years before Christ will come. It's about 100 years, 120 years after all that happened with Isaiah and Hezekiah was we'll actually not quite 100 years because we had Hezekiah with Isaiah. Then we had Manasseh who reigned for 40 years. And then we'll look at Manasseh and his end. And Josiah, of course, was promoted and anointed to be king when he was eight years old. But his ministry, Jeremiah's ministry, began 
in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. And we know that's 627 BC. If you'd like to read the background of what was happening during Jeremiah's ministry, you can find that in 2 Kings 21 through 25 and 2 Chronicles 33 through 36. While Jeremiah was preaching to the people and prophesying to the people about the coming judgment of God and concluding with the exile that was coming, he was not the only prophet that was preaching. Of course, there were false prophets that were preaching the whole time. But there were four other prophets during the same time, some a little before and during, and Ezekiel came right at the end of Jeremiah's ministry and life, and Ezekiel ministered to the people while they were in exile. But Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Ezekiel all prophesied and ministered over the course of Jeremiah's 40-year ministry. If we look at the culture in verses 2 and 3, we read the word of Yahweh came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. And it, came on the, and it came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. The exile happened in 586 B.C. That was the first wave. That's when Jeerusalem was taken. That's when Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were taken to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court along with those who had been taken into captivity. Just uh, Jeremiah's ministry went on for another 16 years to about 570. There was a second wave of that captivity. Now, during these days, the kings of Judah were Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Some of them reigned for a long time. Some of them reigned for only a few years. Some of them were assassinated. It was a time of upheaval. Now you realize that after the nation split, Israel to the north with the capital of Samaria, Judah to the south with the capital in Jerusalem, the kings of Judah were all still from David's line. So they were following in that line that was going to end up with the coming of the Messiah as they were kings in that line. But here as they reigned, we know the story of Hezekiah. We know that Assyria was actually on the decline, Assyria had come to attack Judah. You'll remember that Babylon came to talk to Hezekiah. And part of the problem that Judah got into was that they decided that in order to get help against Assyria, they would get the Babylonians to be their allies. Don't go to the world to be an ally against the world. That's not how it works. In fact, Hezekiah got in trouble with Isaiah because as he showed all of his treasures to the Babylonians. Isaiah told Hezekiah, there's going to be time, they're going to come back and they're going to take it all. It's all going to be gone. Now the Assyrians were stopped because when the Assyrians came to attack, Hezekiah went and threw himself down before the Lord and prayed and sought the Lord. And that night, the angel of the Lord wiped out 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers. The upheaval and the problem that that caused for Sennacherib, the commander of the Assyrians, was that he then went back home empty-handed. He had gone up against this little people who weren't supposed to be any problem at all, and his army was completely wiped out. And he came back and was worshiping before Dagon, his god in Nineveh, when he was assassinated by his own family members because of the shame of his failure, because of what God had done to defeat the Assyrians. Now, we know that after the Assyrians came the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar, and they grew to great strength and great power in the world, and then they began to decline, and we know that the Medes and the Persians came in, and we know that Cyrus was there, Darius was there, and we see the prophecies of Daniel about the nations and how the kingdom of God is going to take the nations out at the knees and how Christ is going to rule and he's going to reign. All of this pointing to the future reign of the Messiah. But we need to pay special attention to Manasseh, because Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, we were told, was a godly king. He pleased and did what was right in the sight of God. His son Manasseh is labeled as the worst of the kings. And when we look at what he did, the things that he allowed to happen in Judah are the main reasons for the judgment and the exile that Jeremiah warns is coming. If you'll turn with me to 2 Kings 21. In 2 Kings chapter 21, starting in verse 2, we're told of Manasseh, he did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to the abominations of the nations whom Yahweh dispossessed before the sons of Israel. 
Indeed, he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. And he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah as Ahab, king of Israel, had done and worshiped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of Yahweh, of which Yahweh had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. The picture here is he's brought all the idols back that Hezekiah tore down, plus some, and even installed altars to idols within the temple, right equal with God. Indeed, he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of Yahweh. He even made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying and interpreted omens. It means he himself was worshiping Molech and encouraging the people of Judah to offer their children as living sacrifices to be burned to death in the fires before Molech. He dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much that was evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger. Then he put the graven image of Asherah, which he had made in the house of which Yahweh had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not make the foot of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave their fathers. If only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen. And Manasseh led them astray in order to do more evil than the nations whom Yahweh destroyed before the sons of Israel. Manasseh led Judah to do things that were even worse than what the Canaanites had done when Israel came to conquer the land. Then Yahweh spoke by the hand of his slaves, the prophets, saying, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has done evil more than all the Amorites did who were before him. And he has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such calamity on Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem, the line of Samaria and the level of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish. He wipes it and turns it upside down. And I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hand of their enemies. And they will become as plunder and spoil to all their enemies because they have done what is evil in my sight. And have been provoking me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. Besides his sin with which he made Judah sin and doing what is evil in the sight of Yahweh. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and all his sin, which he sinned. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house in the gardens of Uzzah. And Amon, his son, became king in his place. His son became king and didn't even last two years before he was assassinated. And so Amon's son had to be hurriedly put on the throne. And that was Josiah when he was eight years old. In 2 Kings 22, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bakshkath. And he did what was right in the sight of Yahweh and walked in all the ways of his father David, and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Now it happened in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king set Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of Yahweh. So here we get a few years into the reign. Actually, Jeremiah appears five years before the scroll is found in the cleaning of the temple. So Jeremiah arrives on the scene, and there is reformation. There's revival. Josiah, even as a young king, is bringing about changes, tearing down the pagan altars, reformalizing the worship of God within Israel. We know from the text that Jeremiah was called in Josiah's 13th year, again, five years before the book was found. When we read that account of what he did, we find out and, and believe, I believe I agree with most of the commentators, I believe that the scroll that they found, that they read to Josiah, was the book of Deuteronomy. And the reason I believe that is because then the focus of Jeremiah's preaching, 86 times in Jeremiah, he quotes 66 times, 66 phrases or verses from the book of Deuteronomy. He's quoting from the law. Now, what was Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy was that restatement of the law before the people went into the land. God gave the Ten Commandments at Sinai. And then Moses read, read them again to the people in Deuteronomy as they prepared to go in to conquer the land because Moses at that point had sinned. He wasn't going with them. So he wanted to remind them what the law was, what the covenant was, what was required of them as they went into the land. Probably the most famous part of the book of Deuteronomy 
is chapters 28 through 32, where you have all of this formula where God says, if you obey me, here's the blessings that follow. But if you disobey me, here's the curses that are going to follow. We see those and we've seen those curses, by the way, fulfilled. When Jesus came to Israel and they rejected him, the curse on them in 70 AD was the coming to pass of all of those covenant curses in the old covenant. The old covenant was gone. It was done. The people had broken the law. They had failed. Jesus had come to institute a new covenant. The curses then were poured out on the people. The new covenant was initiated. The old covenant had wiped away. And the new now found Jesus fulfilling all the requirements of the covenant for us. All of the things the law of God tells us to do, Jesus did on our behalf. Now, that doesn't mean that gets us off the hook and we don't have to do what Jesus says. It means now by grace, we can be obedient. That even though we are lawbreakers, we can be pleasing to God because he's equipped us by grace and by his spirit to obey what his word says. I've talked about this too in our apologetic study for Sunday school as we look at the Ten Commandments. There are those who say that the Ten Commandments were just for Israel and they don't apply to anybody else. Look, the Bible is the Bible. The Word of God is the Word of God. All Scripture is profitable. And when God gave us His law, it's the same law He said He had written on our hearts from the beginning from creation. While the Old Covenant was gone, the Old Testament is not. Don't confuse the two. That moral law, in fact, is what Jesus corrected the Pharisees on in the Sermon on the Mount. You've twisted it and you've heard that it said, but I'm telling you, the law is even worse than you thought because the law goes to the motives of your heart, not just your outward actions. That was critical for the people of Judah to hear because their religion at this point had all become external. They would worship whoever, however, to get a positive result. Total health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Who do I have to worship and what do I have to do to make my life better so that things are easier? And Jeremiah stands to preach against that. And his text, more often than not, is the book of Deuteronomy. By the way, for those who don't like the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament church, do you know that the whole birth of the New Testament church all the way through the 3,000 people that were saved on the day of Pentecost heard sermons from the Old Testament? Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached from the book of Joel. And he preached the scripture to them. And people in the Old Testament, they heard the gospel. <gasps> Imagine that. How could that be? Because the gospel has been the gospel has been the gospel. From Genesis 3.15, even before the creation of the world, the seed of woman was going to crush the head of the serpent. And that was the hope of the world. You'd think this would be a positive message, but as Jeremiah preached, the people didn't want to hear the truth. They didn't want to be warned about their sin. They just wanted to be left alone to do whatever they wanted to do. Sound familiar? Isn't it interesting, by the way, that the same world that tells us to be tolerant won't tolerate us? The same world that tells us not to preach to them points at us anytime we do something they know the Bible says we're not supposed to do. The world knows. They know and they repress that knowledge. The Re Reformation of Josiah, I've preached several messages. In fact, I think I've got a sermon series back there, three or four messages on Josiah. Josiah's Reformation was so amazing that by the time it was finished, he actually, after finding the book and reading the book, he tore his clothes when it was read to him. He repented and immediately began working to restore the observance of Passover with the people, to bring back the right worship of God. In fact, in, in 2 Kings 22, uh, verse 11, it happened that when he heard, the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, and Achor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah is the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of Yahweh for me and the people and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For this is the wrath of Yahweh, which has set a flame against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do all according to all that is written concerning us. His reformation and his reinstitution of the right worship of God and removal of the idols actually brought a respite from the judgment that had been prophesied. Josiah actually sees a time of revival, a time of refreshment. It was one of the only times during all of this that Judah actually was completely independent. They had been dependent upon Egypt. They had depended upon us on Assyria. They were taken over by Babylon. They were trying to depend on all the nations around them for help. When Josiah came in and removed the pagan idols, removed the false gods, reinstituted the worship of God, the people were set free. 
You understand the only freedom we'll ever find in this world, it's not by being born an American. It's by being a slave of Jesus Christ. That's the only freedom on this planet, to belong to Jesus, to worship God in spirit and in truth. As Josiah had begun these reformations and five years into it when this scroll is found, this is when Jeremiah had started preaching. He's preaching, by the way, starting, we believe, probably around the age of 15 or 16 years old. That's why, that's why he said his objection to the call, I'm just a youth. I don't know how to preach to the nations. What do I say to them? And God said, don't say you don't know what to say. I'm going to give you the words. Just say what I tell you. You, you have to understand, preaching is not easy work, but it should be an easy job. Because all the preacher has to do is tell you what God says. I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not creative enough to be inventive enough to tell you what you want to hear. All I can tell you is what God said. That's a relief to me. You don't have to depend on me and my thoughts and my opinions and my lack of education and training and everything else. I just tell you what God says. That's what God says to Jeremiah. You're young. You don't know how to preach. You got this. I'll tell you what to say. You say what I tell you, and you'll be fine. And that's when Jeremiah tells us he didn't want to preach, but he couldn't help it. He couldn't hold it in. He had to say what God said. He was preaching to a culture that was in constant crisis. Unfortunately, the reforms of Josiah weren't enough. What we find out later in 2 Kings 22 is that God says it's not enough. The people are still going to be judged. There's still remnants of an external religion without inward obedience. There is still idolatry. There is still paganism. And so there is still going to be judgment. To be in this culture of constant crisis. Assyria was on the downgrade. Babylon was a rising threat. Everybody was threatening to fight everybody else. Everybody was running to everybody else for help. Uh, the Egyptians were attacking the Babylonians. The Babylonians attacked the Assyrians. The Medo-Persians were getting ready to come attack the Babylonians. Sound familiar? Wars and rumors of wars. People are always attacking somebody else and wanting to take control and wanting to fight, and wanting to do this and wanting to do that. I, I have to admit, as I hope you are praying for Israel this morning, I hope you understand what Iran just proved. They're wimps. They couldn't get anything through the Iron Dome. They tried to throw everything they could at Israel. And God laughed. Didn't happen. Now, it's still a serious attack, and there's still things that are going to be happening, and there's still terrorists loose in their country and in our country. But understand this. only way you can blow Christians up, they're going to come, and they're going to fight, and there's going to be wars, and there's going to be persecution against God's people. There always is. This is the theme of the book of Jeremiah. And he was wanting to preach to the people to tell them, how do you deal with living in a culture of constant crisis? You depend upon a sovereign God who holds your life in his hands. The theme in Jeremiah, just as strong as it is in, in Isaiah, the theme of the sovereignty of God. It, it's just, it's, it, I, I get a kick out of it because you get into some of these technical commentaries preparing to preach and they try to get into the mind of the training and the upbringing of the prophet and what influenced him in his preaching. And, and one, one wrote, and it's a good commentary, good comment. I would recommend it. But in the introduction, he says, we don't quite know where Jeremiah derived his theology of God. Maybe it was that God was talking to him. I, I would think that would be sufficient. Do you see, do you see how even in conservative theological environments, we don't trust the sufficiency of the word of God. We think there, have to, they think there has to be some outward influence to mold us and make us so that we can understand God. No, all you have to do to understand God is have an experience with him. Isaiah saw him high and lifted up in the temple and was never the same. Moses saw him in the burning bush and he was never the same. We just need to hear his words. That is sufficient. Now again, Captivity and exile were imminent. This was not a pretty prophecy. The people were going to be taken into captivity. The best and the brightest were going to be taken from the land. The wall was going to be destroyed. The temple was going to be destroyed. Jerusalem was going to be wiped clean like a dish. And again, Jeremiah 28, 2 through 4. Here are the false prophets. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel. 
I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I'm going to return to this place, all the vessels of the house of Yahweh, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I'm also going to return to this place, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, declares Yahweh, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Talk about health, wealth, and prosperity, your best life now in the Old Testament. Oh, it's bad, but that's okay. Send me $1,000, you'll be out in two years. It'll be fine, trust me. Peace, peace, it's not that bad. Just go along, get along, do whatever they tell you to do. You'll be out in two years. Not a bad thing. Jeremiah said it's going to be 70 years. 70 years. Not many who went in were coming out. Many of those who were coming out were those who were born while their families were in captivity. Here, here are the sign of the times, by the way. Here, here's a description from a historian of what was going on in Babylon at this time. Rapid moral and spiritual decline. External religiosity. Increasing apostasy, increased international conflict and economic tensions, and evidences of divine judgment upon the nations. Y'all understand there's nothing new under the sun? We're there! Ta-da! Welcome home. You see, Jeremiah was preaching to people in a context just like in which we live. Because there's nothing new under the sun. 1 Timothy 4 tells us, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, but the hypocrisy of liars who have been seared into their own conscience, who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God created to be shared with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Everybody says, are we living in the last days? Yes. How long have we been in the last days? Uh, since Jesus came. The last days were inaugurated when he came the first time. We're still there. You, you think, well, it looks like a lot of Christians are falling away. No, what it looks like is a bunch of celebrities who thought they could bank off being a Christian found out that they had to be obedient to Jesus and they're falling away because they don't mean it. And I, and I know well-meaning people think, isn't it great that such and such a celebrity got saved and they have such a large platform to talk about God? No, no, no. Please tell those people to sit down, shut up, and go get discipled. If you have a large platform to talk about God, you better know that you're using his words and not your own and not banking on your celebrity and influence to push people into a decision. Because you know what? God doesn't need a big platform because the earth is his footstool. Where God works are in those little places, in those little churches with those little pastors who nobody's ever heard of, who we're going to see when we get to heaven and we're going to see, look at what God did with that ministry. Nobody knew anything about John MacArthur said, we've got a problem in the evangelical church. The problem is our doctrine and our life is half an inch deep and four miles wide. He said, we need to be about an inch wide and four miles deep. See those roots go deep so that we can grow, so that we can bear fruit. So that when there is rapid moral and spiritual decline, external religiosity, increasing apostasy, increased international conflict and economic tension and evidence of divine judgment, we can stand firm and preach to the people in that culture to flee the wrath to come and to give them the good news. We know who our rescuer is. We know who has come to bring us deliverance. When we look at the call of Jeremiah, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, before I formed you in the innermost parts, I knew you. And before you came out from the womb, I set you apart. I have given you as a prophet to the nations. His call, actually similar to Moses, to Gideon, to Isaiah, and even to Paul. Uh, Paul said, when God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb, called me through his grace. That was his testimony of salvation. Jeremiah, here's the same thing. Before you were even conceived, I knew you, I chose you, and I called you so that you might go and be a prophet to the nations. These callings with Moses uh, in Exodus 3, with Gideon in Judges 6, with Isaiah, the similarity is there's a call and a commission, and immediately there's an objection from the prophet being called. What did Moses say? I can't speak. I stutter. I don't speak well. Aaron's going to have to talk for me. We're talking about this before service. I, I always get a kick out of it because I actually found a video to play with the eclipse last week. 
and it was Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. Then you shall see hail and fire and darkness shall cover the land for three minutes. But I thought that's appropriate with everybody freaking out over all the disaster that's supposed to happen. Everybody survived the eclipse, by the way. Everybody okay? Glorious thing. Glorious thing. We're in our backyard. We're a couple of miles from a big park where there were thousands of people out to watch it. And when that thing eclipsed and those people cheered, God got the glory because of the dynamics of the world he had created. But when, when, when we see that, we understand that Charlton Heston wasn't a good choice to play Moses. Because he looks good and he talks good. And Moses said, did it, did it, did it, I don't, did it, did it, did it. Let Aaron talk. My lips, my tongue are thick. I can't do this. Uh, really, I think he was just afraid. Jeremiah says the same thing. I, I, I'm a youth. I don't, I don't know how to speak. How am I going to speak to the nations? I don't have anything to say to them. I, I, I'm young. I can't do this. The objection from Gideon was the same. Well, with each of those, God gives a reassurance. God gives a reassurance. And the reassurance is this. Moses, Gideon, Jeremiah, Isaiah. This isn't your work. It's mine. This isn't your word. It's mine. So you go where I say. You say what I say and leave the results to me. And I'll say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. What a freedom to know that when you preach God's word, you're not responsible for what people do with it. Because most of the time what they're going to do with it is ignore it and hate you. Preach the word, live the word. And if they don't respond, that's okay. Seed was sown. And what God promises, there's four types of hearts, four types of soil. Leave it to the spirit. Somebody else is going to come along, break up the fallow ground. Somebody else is going to come along, water that seed. And God's going to give the increase in his time. And when he does, nobody's going to be able to look back and name off all the list of people that were involved. It's just going to be to God be the glory. Great things he has done. That was his response. Don't say, I am a youth. Did, uh, did God have to say that to anybody else? In the scriptures, I, I remember uh, Paul had to say something to Timothy, didn't he? Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but show yourself as a model to those who believe in the word, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Don't let anybody despise your age or your, your youth or your lack of youth or your experience or your lack of experience. When we're speaking his words, we leave the results in his hands. God says in this call, before I formed you. Before I formed you, I knew you. That word formed there is a word from the basis of a potter working with clay. And we'll have, in fact, the title of this whole series is The Potter and the Clay. We'll have a whole section on the potter and the clay. And Paul borrows from that, obviously, in the book of Romans. Before I formed you, before I knit you, before I put you together, crafted you in your mother's womb. This is the same word, by the way, that is used in Genesis 2, 7. Then Yahweh God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And so he became a living being. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 2 through 4, we read, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will make you hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was ruined in the hand of the potter. So he turned around and made it into another vessel according to what was right in the eyes of the potter to make it. Here is the underlying theme of the prophecies and the preaching of Jeremiah. We're just the clay. God is the potter. And if we think he's messed up, made a mistake, that we're not turning out like we're supposed to, trust me, he can tear us down and remake us, can't he? How many times does it happen? You see somebody working with clay on a wheel and it doesn't work quite right. And what do they do? Mash it all down. Start over to build it back up. Now, the good news is God doesn't make mistakes. And, and, and the, other, the other truth is, I mean, let's just admit it. God has a family full of cracked pots. Okay? Just admit it. But he is the potter and we are the clay. And what he is making from us will ultimately turn out for our good and his glory. Do we trust that he is sovereign enough to do that? Before I formed you, I knew you, he says. That is factual, intimate knowledge. Say, how in the world can God know somebody before they're even conceived? Because he's God and he inhabits eternity. 
because he's there at the beginning and the end, because time is something that he's created and he's all around it and outside of it. He interjects himself into it. But for God, there just is because he just is. And so he is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning from the end because he is the beginning and the end. And so he says, I knew you before you were even born. And in knowing you, he says, I set you apart. This word means to consecrate, to set apart from every other use for a specific, particular use. He says to Jeremiah, before you were ever born, I knew you and I appointed you. I set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. That, that means literally God said, you exist to be my spokesperson to the nations. That's why you are here. That was God's intent in the creation of the prophet of Jeremiah. And he says, I've given you, I've appointed you to a specific assignment as a prophet to the nations. One commentator says on this, there is no limit to God's sovereignty. Therefore, there are no limits to the scope of Jeremiah's ministry. Wherever God wanted him to go, he was going to go. Wherever God wanted him to say, he was going to say. And there wasn't going to be anybody in the earth that could stop him. Being given as a prophet, by the way, Paul expresses this in Ephesians 4.11. He says that Christ has given his people gifts. Those gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Men that God has called and equipped and set apart from before they were born to be here, to be his spokesperson, to preach his words to his people. God reassured Jeremiah after he objected, you're going to go everywhere I send you. You're going to say everything I command you to say. And he tells him, don't be afraid of them. Who? Anybody. You understand there's only one thing you need to fear. Only one. And that's God. And if you fear him, you shouldn't be afraid of anything else. He says, for I am with you to deliver you. Literally, I am with you to rescue you, declares Yahweh. <clears throat> Meaning from the call that he got, you're going to be in trouble at times. And we're going to find out Jeremiah was in trouble a lot of times. His life was threatened. He had to run and hide. He had to be lowered down over a wall in a basket. All these things happened. He was taken into exile into Egypt at one point. But God says through it all. I will deliver you. I'm with you. His commission then that God gives to confirm the call in verses 9 and 10, then Yahweh sent forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Yahweh said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I've appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to cause to perish and to pull down, to build and to plant. Yahweh touched his mouth. It's reminiscent of what happened to Isaiah, right? Isaiah said, woe is me, I'm undone, I can't do this. And what happened? An angel came with tongs, took a coal from the altar, and put it to his lips. Now, what does it mean anytime we're talking about the mouth, the lips, the tongue? Ultimately, that speaks what's in the heart. To cleanse the mouth, then, is to cleanse the heart. God says, I'm giving you a new heart so that you can do this. I'm cleansing you with a coal from the altar. The same thing happened to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 3, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me this scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. God fed him, literally fed him the words that he was then to preach to others. What a blessing. What an assurance. We know Jeremiah still doubted. But for God to say, I've put my words into your mouth. By the way, you know that God has put his words into your mouth too. You know how you get his words to come out of your mouth? You hide it in your heart. You put his word in your heart and that's what comes out of your mouth. Jesus said to us, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. This was true not only of Jeremiah, but even of Jesus. Jesus said, the words I'm going to preach are the words the Father has given to me. Moses prophesied that in Deuteronomy 18. I will raise up a prophet from among the brothers like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them to them all that I commanded him. That's Moses prophesying the coming of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 41, 10, do not fear. I'm with you, God says to Isaiah. Do not be anxious, for I am your God. 
I will make you mighty. Surely I will help you. Surely I will hold you with my righteous hand. And Isaiah 43, 5, do not fear for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. God says your future is in my hands. Your life is in my hands. Your security is in my hands. Now I do want you to understand something very critical here though. God says I will deliver you. Don't be afraid because I'm with you. I'm not going to let them hurt you. And so we immediately transpose that and think nobody's ever going to persecute me. He made this promise to Isaiah. And what happened to Isaiah? He died by being stuffed into a log and that log was sawn in two. Well, God didn't fulfill his promise. Sure he did. Because while that was happening, God was with him and working it out for Isaiah's good and God's glory. How can you getting sawed in two in a log be worked out for your good? Well, you know, it's just voompa, 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 Jesus. <laughs> That's it. You're secure. I will be your deliverance. The work is sovereign. The words are God's. And here's his commission in the last verse. I'm sending you to do two things. One, to pronounce judgment. And second, to preach restoration. The judgment is to dislodge entrenched wickedness by uprooting, tearing down, destroying, and overthrowing. The restoration is to rebuild on a foundation of God's grace, to build and to plant. Now, I truly appreciate Walter Kaiser in his commentary, which just recently came out on this. I didn't even realize that uh, Dr. Kaiser was still alive. Praise the Lord. I recommend it to you. I'll send you a list of the commentaries I'm using. But as I read Dr. Kaiser, he said, you have to realize that when God told Jeremiah, uproot, tear down, destroy, overthrow, build and replant, the problem in the church today is that we like doing the first four, but nobody's doing the other two. We like the uproot, the tear down, the destroy, and the overthrow. But building and planting takes time, effort, and money. It's easy to tear things down. You watch these TV shows where they're tearing down a house to rebuild things. And what does everybody love? Demolition day. Why? I just get to tear it to shreds. And it doesn't matter. But then when it comes to rebuild it, to replant it, to restore it. And yet God says these, these, by the way, are two actions that are both going to be accomplished by his word. His word is the hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. His word also is the balm of Gilead that soothes a broken soul and brings restoration and healing. So what is the tool that we have to use? The words he's put in our mouth, the words that we've hidden in our heart. As we embark on this study through Jeremiah, I'm excited to look and to see what Jeremiah told the people, what he preached to the nations, what he preaches to us. Here, here's the good news for those of you who are not organized. Neither was Jeremiah. Most difficult, there is no chronology. It's hard to figure out a timetable. It's like he just preached for 40 years and people were writing down his sermons and just publishing them as fast as they could. So some of it, we don't even know the circumstances behind what he was saying, but we know that the words he was given were the words of God. Isn't that really how it should be anyway? Whatever the circumstance, whatever you're facing, go to the word of God. What does it tell you? Do what he has said. Tell others what he has said and trust him with the results. He's sovereign. And we sang it this morning. This was Martha's favorite hymn. Those of you who didn't know Martha before God called her home. Whatever my God ordains is right. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, how we do thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that you have given us your word through the prophets, through the apostles, through evangelists and pastor teachers, with the work and the help of the Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, who teaches us all truth. You have given us the ability to read and to understand and to comprehend and to, to long for and to crave your word so that we might hear it and so that we might be doers of it. Remind us that the power of your word is found in your sovereignty. That the words you've given us to speak are your words. And they are sufficient for us. I do pray that we would see our view of you exalted. Our love for your word 
our, our cherishing your word just to grow as we grow in it and are grown by it in these weeks and months ahead. Speak to us as you spoke to Jeremiah. Give us your word. And I pray you find us faithful to hear and to do it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.